Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this important celebration. My name is Rebecca Cunningham, and I'm the Vice President for Research here at the University of Michigan. I'm so pleased to join you all virtually as we celebrate the impact and importance of public engagement across our three campuses. For more than 200 years, the University of Michigan community has exemplified public engagement. It is even written into our mission that we aim to serve the people of Michigan and the world through education, research, and scholarship. And even during a global pandemic, it is quite evident that our faculty and students remain fully committed to serving the public good. Today, we have the honor of celebrating some incredible individuals who use their passion and expertise to address many of the wicked problems facing our society, ranging from COVID-19 pandemic and youth violence to election security and affordable housing. You will hear more about these individuals later in the program, but they truly do exemplify the University of Michigan and its overall vision for public engagement. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize the countless individuals working in Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Flint who engage with audiences outside their campuses on a routine basis. We are the nation's largest public research university, and so we have an obligation to ensure that our insights and discoveries are translated in a way that positively benefits the world around us. Before I introduce President Mark Schlissel, I would like to share a brief video that highlights the impact and importance of public engagement across the university. The focus of my work has been, how do we understand what goes on as cities lose population and jobs? How do housing markets adjust? What are the socio-political economic systems that intervene in that process? And because I'm an urban planner, I also focus on, okay, what do we do about it to make life better for the people who are living and working through that system? So I'm part of a team at the U of M School of Public Health that has done a lot of work with the state to collect data from the state systems, the state disease systems on cases that are happening and then um, analyze it and present it in a really granular way so that people can see for their community on a very fine level how much disease is around in their community, what the percent positivity is, um, what different thresholds for different levels of the disease in the community is and to provide that information. And my work is about uh, computer security and more specifically, the security of election systems. I work on positive youth development, uh, specifically uh, uh, violence prevention. Um, and, uh, but my, most of my work focuses on what goes right in kids' lives rather than what goes wrong. And then thinking about how do we help uh, kids uh, do the, what goes right in their lives. We live in a complex world with all kinds of challenges and threats, and solving those is going to require the entire arsenal of human intellectual tools. Bringing science to bear on challenging public policy problems um, is necessary to deal with the complexities of 21st century life. I think it's really easy, and we saw this especially before the pandemic, to um, get siloed and into your work in a way that you're really talking to other, you're, you're preaching to the choir half the time, you're talking to other people that really understand the issues the same way you do. And I think that one of the things that public engagement does is it stretches you to think about your work in new ways, and it challenges you to be positioning your work in a way that it can be impactful in a fast and kind of meaningful timeline for people. If I want to do work that's going to help improve people's lives or improve communities and neighborhoods, how do I do that as a researcher without talking with and engaging and having you know input and collaboration with those we're trying to work with? We not only have to do that, we have to tell people about it. And so I see this award as partly the university showing people this is how we move towards achieving our mission. There are not many places where public service in science is as valued as it is at the University of Michigan. And um, it's just a, a deep thrill to be part of this place. There's a lot of great people at this university, a lot of great people doing a lot of really um, meaningful work that will affect and improve people's lives. 
And so to be selected last year as sort of a, one of the leading faculty here at the university doing that kind of work is really humbling. It's really kind of heartening for me to see um, this award kind of recognize efforts, you know, from a, a lot of different people uh, around um, getting good information into the hands of people. It never occurred to me that someone would nominate me for this. And I, I feel so honored. As I'm talking, I'm thinking about all the people I've worked with as partners. It's their award too, really, because we have worked together to accomplish things. I would like to now introduce President Mark Schlissel. Having worked closely with President Schlissel over the years, I have always appreciated his passion and support for public engagement. In 2015, at his direction, a committee was charged to evaluate and make recommendations to bolster and support faculty engagement and leadership to the benefit of society. The work of this committee launched the Presidential Initiative on Public Engagement, creating a spotlight on the contributions our faculty have on communities and the nation. The university has also developed new tools and resources to help faculty share their expertise and research capacity with the public through purposeful efforts focused outside the academy. Thank you, President Schlissel. As an educator, researcher, and clinician, I greatly appreciate your ongoing commitment to public engagement. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rebecca, Dr. Cunningham, for the introduction and for your own uh, outstanding work. And congratulations uh, to all of our awardees. Uh, a year and a half ago, faculty from six of our schools and colleges institute and institutes um, sent an 18-page letter to the U.S. House of Representatives Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. In it, they addressed a range of topics as only Michigan faculty can. There were policy recommendations on different industry sectors, disaster preparation, carbon sequestration, agriculture and oceans, forestry and public lands, the recommendations were grounded in research with specific action items. As Dean Overpeck said after the letter was sent, in my experience, activities like this go a long way in making U of M the go-to experts for this information in the future and ensuring our research continues to have maximum impact. As president, one of my priorities since joining the University of Michigan has been to encourage and support our faculty who use their academic expertise to contribute to the solution of society's most daunting problems. To reach across disciplines and bring to bear the full intellectual might of our academic breadth and depth. I believe our future success will be defined in part by our ability to contribute to the solutions to these problems. Last week, our Center for Academic Innovation announced this year's cohort of 17 public engagement faculty fellows. The fellows will spend the summer building skills and planning, and they'll receive support for a public engagement project. Congratulations, fellows. Another benefit of our faculty uh, public engagement initiative is sharing our expertise broadly with a world that needs it. We've heard much in this past year about the need for a national stockpile of respirators, PPE, or vaccines but we rarely talk about the stockpile of knowledge and expertise that we can tap into within our nation's universities. Yet our intellectual resources are always tapped. U of M researchers last year disseminated their expertise on the vast impacts of COVID-19, including public health, remote work, virtual learning, democracy and debate and social justice. This included more than 1,800 pieces of published social media content, 150 Michigan Minds podcast interviews, and 225 published articles on publicengagement.umich.edu. Our Michigan Minds podcast received 55,000 listens, which is an 85% increase over the prior year. 300 of our faculty members were promoted as national and global experts with news media around the world. We produced 55 expert videos on a variety of timely issues surrounding the election, COVID-19 and more, receiving thousands of views. The expert videos were shared with news media across the globe, prompting reporters to reach out to talk with faculty 
for their stories. U of M again led the nation in the number of faculty articles published in The Conversation US, totaling 86 articles with 51.1 million reads. I was proud to create our Public Engagement Award several years ago to further celebrate and stimulate our work. And because we had to cancel the event last year, we have the pleasure of hearing from not one, but two years worth of honorees uh, in today's discussion. This panel of four awardees is truly spectacular. The recipient of the 2019 President's Award for National and State Leadership is J. Alex Halderman, Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Director of the Center for Computer Security and Society in the College of Engineering. This award honors individuals who provide sustained, dedicated, and influential leadership and service in major national or state capacities. Professor Haldeman focuses his research on computer security and privacy, emphasizing problems that broadly impact society and public policy. He's a noted election security expert and has worked to educate members of Congress, members of our federal judiciary system, and states about the need for election cybersecurity improvements. He also co-chairs Michigan's Election Security Advisory Commission. The recipient of the 2019 Award for Public Impact is Mark Zimmerman, Professor of Public Health and Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education and Director of the Prevention Research Center and the Michigan Youth Violence Prevention Center in the School of Public Health. The award honors individuals whose research and expertise tangibly address a major public sector challenge. Professor Zimmerman focuses on how positive factors in adolescents' lives help them overcome risks. His model of empowerment and empirical work around assets and resources that help youth overcome adverse childhood experiences are widely cited. He started Youth Empowerment Solutions in Flint leads multiple youth violence prevention efforts, and help form the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center to give a voice to community representatives in the water crisis. Congratulations, Dr. Zimmerman. The recipient of the 2020 Award for National and State Leadership goes to Emily Toth Martin, Associate Professor of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. Professor Martin received multiple nominations for her outstanding COVID-19 surveillance work and engagement efforts throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, along with her work with Governor Whitmer's office and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She participated in numerous panels, forums, and news stories to share critical facts and promote public health guidance on slowing the spread of the virus. Professor Martin also leads the massive asymptomatic testing program for our campus. And I'd like to offer on a personal note, Emily has been indispensable in our campus's response to the pandemic and advising me and the other senior leadership of the university. Congratulations, Emily. The 2020 Award for Public Impact goes to Margaret Dewar, Professor Emerita of Urban and Regional Planning in the A. Alfred Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Professor Dewar's work on American cities that have experienced abandonment and loss of employment with the goal of helping strengthen deteriorated neighborhoods and enhance access to safe and affordable housing. For decades, she's worked with Detroit city officials and community leaders to make affordable housing available to low-income residents. The relationship she built led to the implementation of evidence-based practices that are helping Detroiters and shaping policy. Congratulations to all four recipients of our President's Award for Public Engagement. A round of applause. We're now going to reorganize ourselves and we'll conduct a panel discussion uh, amongst myself and the uh, other uh, recipients of the award. So give us a moment to get ourselves organized. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Um, 
first of all, to the entire group, congratulations again. Um, your work as faculty members uh, has addressed major societal issues and given you each the opportunity to make a difference outside the academy. Uh, did you envision this when you began your careers or were there purposeful steps you took along the way to make this public impact a reality? Uh, Margaret, why don't we start with you? Sure, I did envision this, or not exactly this, of course, but I wanted to make a difference outside the academy as well as inside. That's exactly what I wanted to do. I loved teaching and research to advance scholarship and urban planning, but I also wanted to change practice and policy for the better. And for me, that meant integrating social justice social con concern for social justice much more into planning than it was. And it meant addressing industrial decline, regional inequality, poverty, and racism. So I set out to find ways that my research and my teaching could try to accomplish those goals simultaneously. So I did have done research that informs what urban planners and policymakers should do while I also worked on making enduring contributions to understanding how systems work in hard up cities like Detroit and how policy and planning interventions affect those systems. So this is kind of a, a sort of culmination of all the efforts I've been making in a way, which I so appreciate. That's great. Uh, uh, Alex, um, how about yourself? You know, did you imagine as you entered into your career that you know you become a rock star on television around a contested election? <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I, I did enter this career path in part wanting to be that public face of my ideas because that's that's really one of the things that separates this job as a professor from so many of the other things that you can do in life. You get not only to think and work on challenging problems, but you get to be the spokesperson and the advocate for your ideas and bringing them to bear out in the world to help make that change you want to see happen. Um, in terms of what I did to try to prepare for that, I think one of the most important things that I intentionally tried to get better at is communicating technical ideas um, to smart people who are not experts. And to do that well um, requires communicating um, without losing why the idea is interesting to people who are experts. Quite often when things are translated for uh, non-specialists, you lose that. And what's left is just basically shock value or entertainment. But getting at the meat of the problem for people, um, that's what makes you successful at uh, communicating the importance. Uh, uh, thanks, Alex. That seems you know, particularly challenging, communicating in a way that is understandable to a broad public, yet true to the professionals that are your everyday colleagues. Uh, and you know you certainly strike that balance very well. Uh, uh, Emily, how about you? How intentional was you ending up in the public spotlight during a once in a lifetime global pandemic? You know, it, um, it's, you know, public engagement is something I actually had shied away from earlier in my career, I think. And, um, and I, you know, some people on here know this, I was supposed to be on sabbatical this year. And actually the focus of my time off was supposed to be on focusing on public policy and public engagement and how to get more experience. So I guess I had nailed that one. Um, but I, I, the, I had just finished up with the chart, uh, with the U of M chart, the Center for Health and Research Transformation from their Public Policy Fellowship Program. I had just finished um, in March of last year. And so had started to take steps in my career to get more towards this space. And so it was really rewarding to be able to put that into action. Um, and one of the things that I learned that immediately became important was um, learning about understanding how to make noise around a, a specific ask, and knowing, knowing the point that you need to get across when you are engaging, you know, knowing ahead of time, what is the one message that you want people taking home from your comments? 
And that's something that I think is, I've really come back to over the last year is to think like, what is the most important thing for the audience to hear from this news article or the most important piece for this legislator to, to hear right now, if, if they're gonna take one thing away from our conversation. Well, I'll tell you, Emily, I found you to be the exact right person at the right moment, both for our state and for the university. You know, you really operated so much behind the scenes that I don't think the general public appreciates the role you played, but both in terms of supporting the governor's team and their decision-making, uh, and then the university's leadership in trying to figure out how to navigate these circumstances. Um, that's you know profound public service, so thank you again. Uh, Mark, uh, how about you? Did you envision this uh, career pathway and your impact? Well, yeah, I think I did too. We, we, uh, Margaret and I are the, um, the, you know, the ends of this conversation. But um, when I was an undergraduate, I did some community organizing and we actually kind of won the day. And I realized that, you know, if you organize with other people, you can actually get something done. Um, and so then I got, went on and get a, got a PhD in community psychology, which is sort of an action oriented version of uh, psychology. Uh, with social change oriented, studying social change. And so really, I, I sort of knew from the get go that I want to end up here, which is why it's um, especially um, rewarding to have uh, received this award. And I wanna thank you and the committee and all my colleagues that helped me be here because uh, you, know, you don't get here alone. That's one thing for sure. And I stand on the shoulders of um, my colleagues as, as Margaret said in, in the video that started this. Um, there's no question that this is uh, uh, a, a group effort and there's others, uh, community partners, as well as my colleagues and staff and everybody who helped me get here. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to you, Margaret. You know, I, my own observation uh, is much earlier in my career. Um, I think there might have even been a stigma against people that were scholars that did too much talking to the public. Uh, as if it somehow wasn't part of our job or somehow diluted our mission or our focus. Uh, over your own career, um, how has academic culture changed around being an engaged scholar? Um, and um, how has that contributed to your success or is it the other way around? Has your success contributed to a change in culture? Well, it has changed, that's for sure. I agree with you. There used to be quite a bit of stigma, a sense that, um, that was a lower kind of work somehow. And, but let me just speak to this from my perspective, because of course I'm not a scholar of higher education. <laughs> so I, I um, graduated from private institutions. And then my first faculty job was at a land grant university. And what was so striking was that service was separate from um, research. And it, we were supposed to do both at the land grant school, but they weren't integrated and it just didn't feel right. And so then I came to Michigan um, in 1988 and I wanted to work on issues that were facing Detroit as a city where lots of the challenges I was interested in were more severe than anywhere else. And therefore the political socioeconomic forces at work were more exposed. But um, what I found when I got here was that there were very few linkages between the university and Detroit. I had trouble finding other faculty who were, who had my same interests in trying to generate mutually beneficial work in teaching and research projects with partners in the city. And in Detroit, I heard complaints from people about being studied, but never benefiting from that study. And I, I actually thought that was an overstated problem. And I continue to think that, but still, that's what I heard. So I feel like U of M is profoundly different now. My college now has numerous faculty, two of them in that faculty fellowship program that you mentioned a couple of times this year for this year's uh, fellows, they have interest in making an impact in mutually beneficial ways too. And faculty with interests of that type are in every single professional school now. And in all the social science departments, in history, the residential college, in American culture, and I better 
stop listing because I know I'll leave some out. Um, and the environment around us is profoundly different. Then it has helped make the change possible. Um, I, I, you asked if I had helped make that happen. Well, I sort of did because I was director of Ginsburg Center for a while, and I also led a have led um, the Detroit Community Partnership Center. Um, but other institutions just have cropped up from lots of people's efforts. The Center for Educational Outreach, um, community-based research projects in public health. And then there are these groups that now support us financially, the Graham Institute, Poverty Solutions, Close Up, the Humanities Collaboratory, and others. It just pretty amazing. Um, there's the Detroit Center, and there's even the Detroit Connector Bus, which one of the things that most struck me when I first came here from having lived a while in Boston and in Minneapolis was that there was no public transportation. So the Detroit Connector is in a way a symbol of how much change has happened. It's really quite phenomenal. Great. Uh, and Alex. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Alex, your, your work on election security is high profile, but I understand that isn't really the main focus of your academic research program. But, you know, despite this, you've committed an awful lot of time. Uh, and although it sounds grand, you've really helped secure democracy uh, in the context of state and national elections. And there isn't a whole lot more important to our society than that. Uh, how did this happen? And then what's been the... Um, uh, consequences of this on your academic career and the other research that you do? Well, I like to think of myself as being more of a security generalist. I'd like to work on computer security problems that have connections to the real world and to people's everyday lives. Um, but there are many problems that have nothing to do with elections that uh, are core to my work, securing the internet, combating online censorship in places like Iran and China, um, even trying to put computer security broadly onto a more quantified and empirical footing. But still election security has been a, a focus of my work for a long time, ever since I was a, a graduate student when my research group was contacted by an anonymous source who gave us a voting machine to study. And that was the first hands-on academic investigation of real election security. So um, sometimes problems choose you. And I think this problem chose me in a couple of ways, not just the serendipity of that first project as a student, um, but also because it's, it's a small field that badly needs more expertise. Uh, there are plenty of people who are working on securing the internet and uh, plus or minus one isn't going to make a heck of a lot of difference. But in election security, I feel like uh, even, even one more can be a huge help. Um, it's been a fantastic lens though, despite there being certain trade-offs in terms of finite time and energy. It's been a, a fantastic lens, election security, with which to study computer security more broadly, and a, a wonderful tool to try to get students more interested in studying security to begin with. Um, because securing elections is going to require progress on many of the hardest computer security challenges there are, and yet be a result that everyone can relate to. Uh, tell me, though, um, Alex, did all of the media appearances you were making around the time of the election and, you know, stop the steal uh, moment in our nation's history, uh, did it change the way your colleagues looked at you as, um, yeah, I remember the, the story of the late Carl Sagan, you know, who was actually, you know, quite an astronomer, except his, you know, public work and his showmanship actually made people wonder whether he was a substantial scholar as well. Uh, have, have you experienced any of that? Um, I, don't, I don't think I have in, in, my own, in my own experience, but I know it was something I worried about more when I was an assistant professor than I do now. And it's one of the, the great things about the tenure process that it takes some of those worries out of your mind. 
Yeah. Uh, Emily, our nation was thrust into this global pandemic, the likes of which none of us had ever really experienced and weren't uh, prepared for, at least on a practical level. And you were consequently thrown into the position of having to make sense of the spread of the virus and advising the governor and other state leaders. Uh, tell us how you ended up in that role and how has being front and center during a crisis affected your academic life? Yeah, well, I, you know, to be honest, um, much of last March and February of last year is pretty blurry. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I, and, I, and I can speak, I think, for a lot of epidemiologists that um, a lot of us were thrown into it really quickly. And I think, you know, and Marissa Eisenberg and I talk to this a lot that we'll talk to anybody. If you ask me a question about epidemiology, I'll answer it. Um, and I'll do this for anybody. And, and that just kind of grew and grew. And I know, you know, U of M really did a wonderful job of valuing the importance of getting good information out there and coming to us and, and both U of M overall, but then the School of Public Health, you know, my dean and my chair were incredibly supportive of saying, we're gonna support you, you get out there and you make sure that good information is getting in front of people. And that was, you know, just incredibly empowering to have that, that kind of support. Um, you know, in terms of how it's changed things academically, it's been really interesting to see a lot of epidemiologists, even my former classmates and colleagues around the country go through the same sort of transformation because I think epidemiology is very, it's in right now. Um, everybody wants to talk to an epidemiologist, but there's also this um, valuing of the field that I don't think we've had before. Epidemiology has sometimes been seen as just kind of reporting numbers and, and stats and, and maybe not as scholarly um, deep as other fields. And now we really see the power and the value of the field. So I actually think it's really kind of increased the academic value of, of traditional surveillance and epidemiology. It used to be, you know, NIH would tell you don't write surveillance in a grant application. It'll put it right at the bottom of the pile because it's not interesting. And we've really seen how important it is now. You know, we're also seeing not just here, but nationally, a big uptick in applications for people that want to get masters in public health or want to get public health degrees. So that's, you know, really fantastic. And hopefully our country will not forget public health as soon as we've taken our masks off and the pandemic is in the rearview mirror because there'll certainly be a next one, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, your, your own research uh, based on empowering theories has had significant impacts on our communities, both at home and across the nation. Uh, this has shaped the states and the nation's understanding of youth violence and led to safer urban communities. Uh, what lessons have you learned about using inferences from your work to positively influence public policy? Wow, good question. Um, really, I, I think it's um, kind of finding the partners who are willing to kind of work with you, first of all, and then it's the building the trust with them. Um, I found that uh, you also build trust through actions, not just words. Uh, and you have to be where the partners are, not where you want them to be. Um, I've also learned that persistence pays, that uh, you just have to keep coming back to the table, so to speak, uh, and you have to um, honor you know, their expertise. And they are sometimes our community partners, but also the staff. I, um, I really try to listen to the staff and what the staff have to say and what their ideas are, uh, who I work with. Um, I think being humble that, that we offer an expertise, but we don't know everything. Um, and that um, we have to kind of sort of be true to what we believe in, if we believe in uh, making a difference in, in from our research. And two things just to add to that. One is uh, you know, the famous line from uh, Hamlet's, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet was, uh, uh, to thine own self be true. Um, and if I really believe in, in change, and if I really believe in, in positive, um, in, in, in helping people have voice in their worlds and, and positive development, uh, then um, you know, you, you gui I'm guided by that. Uh, and then uh, the last thing is, uh, you know, the, there's always this word about the work that we do. We publish journal articles and they sit in journals and collect dust on shelves. Um, and led me to think about the joke that what happens to old professors uh, they just collect dust on the shelf. And I didn't want to be one of those people. So one of the lessons I've always learned is how does what we're looking and finding uh, make a difference in people's lives and then 
um, work with partners to help translate that research. It's really interesting, Mark, because you know, part of my motivation in pushing public engagement as a, a university value and uh, working uh, to have faculty at all different career stages get some type of career credit for this activity has to do with what I think is an erosion in the public's perception of the value of research universities. And I think the public too often sees us talking to one another and writing for one another and wondering why are they supporting us? You know, who, who cares how many angels you can fit on the head of a pin? You know, we, we need real problems with real solutions. And I know this work was going on and I don't think the public knows, knew that this work was going on. So, you know, anything we can do to represent the value of the public's investment in a public research university, I think helps assure the future of our institution. So that was part of my motivation for pushing this forward. So. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to ask a question to the group as a whole, but before I do that, uh, please, if any in the audience have questions or comments they'd like to offer, uh, just queue up using the chat function, and I'll try my best to call on you. I may get some help from backstage calling on you. Uh, but uh, first, let me ask the group as a whole, uh, support for the kind of work you do, the engaged work. Uh, can uh, one of you or several give me an example of something that's been helpful uh, uh, that has enabled your public engagement work and something you think is lacking in disseminating your work beyond the academy. What should we be doing more of to promote this work? Anybody? Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, one thing that's been absolutely fantastic has been uh, the Washington DC office. And particularly, I'd like to give a shout out to Christina Coe, who has been absolutely wonderful in helping me connect successfully with members of Congress. Yep. I would, and I would add that um, the communications office has been absolutely wonderful. Greta Guest and, and some of her colleagues came and gave our faculty a, a workshop on how to work with the press. And what I had been finding was that I was giving sort of mini seminars to reporters from across the country on how do cities work, how do housing markets work, how, whatever. And then they, they would take those lessons and they would go interview different people instead of me. And I, I asked Greta, so why don't they say what I said? And she said, after every interview, make sure you say, what? are you going to take away from this? And it works. So um, that was incredibly helpful. Yeah, I, I've been blessed to be in a school of public health. I mean, in our name uh, is public. Um, and there's always been an idea that our work is applied you know, at, at some very fundamental level. And being in the department I'm in, um, it's very much people oriented. Um, but I want to say that I just want to do a shout out to you, uh, Professor Sissel, that really having a supportive university behind that has been really, really helpful. Uh, I think it helped uh, because, you know, some of the barriers that, you know, especially in sort of the tenure track system and all that are the multiple demands and the reward structures are really um, not always there. Um, you know, service is, is a list, is on the list, but it's, you know, a, a smaller percentage. So you helping and the university being supportive of this kind of work and helping to promote it has really been, um, I think, very helpful for the university and for my younger colleagues to see the value in uh, doing some more applied kind of science. So I wanna say thank you to, to you for that. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, you know, I, I, another you know, general question to anyone or ones in the group, uh, you're all well established you know, leaders, you have reputations in your field as scholars, and you've also been doing this engaged work for quite some time in your career. Uh, what advice would you give our earlier uh, career stage colleagues uh, who are looking to make a difference to their work, perhaps untenured faculty that are worried about publications and teaching evaluations and internal service that uh, uh, we demand of our colleagues? I, th I can start. I think that's a tough one, you know, because the tenure system is not set up for the, the, this that well, right? And I don't, you know, I don't know that I would have gotten nearly as involved if I hadn't had tenure. Um, and um, 
even even so, even with tenure, I still kind of checked in with my school public health leadership and said, you realize I'm not going to publish much this year. And they were like, we got, we got you, you know, you're good. And I think that, you know, for younger faculty or more kind of early career faculty, we've got to figure out a way to be supportive um, and, and as um, it, you know, create that supportive environment so that they feel safe doing this type of thing. I think there's, you have to make them feel safe in both the time investment, but then also there's always that fear. What if I say something and I insult somebody who's going to be reviewing my tenure packet? What if I, you know, there's, there's, there's that, we have to make it, we have to make it more acceptable for people to go out there and put their voice out there without kind of academic repercussions, I think. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the, I, I kind of try to uh, give advice to faculty to sort of balance that with Emily was saying, and I concur 100% what you said, Emily, is um, while you're working with developing community partnerships, developing that trust, because that takes time, um, to also think about other data that you could be analyzing that might inform the work that you're doing with those community partners that you could then even present to them as, um, you know, part of a conversation about where uh, points of uh, intervention or points of change might uh, be helpful. So it, it is a little bit, learn how to be a juggler um, a little bit, but I think don't, don't forget that there is still the importance of, of contributing to knowledge and then thinking about how ways that the process of getting engaged in, in engaging community, at least in, in our work, how that can itself be a lesson learned that could be a, a source to add to knowledge and uh, in the scientific community. Other thoughts? I would add that I would say, just do it. And there's not that much time in the day. <laughs> Every one of us only has 24 hours and we have to sleep part of that. So, but <laughs> if you make everything double count, so the research, and the teaching are producing both knowledge, wonderful uh, students who will graduate and be the leaders and the best, and who um, and bodies of knowledge, adding to bodies of knowledge, and just make sure everything has both embedded, because you can't find more time. There's no way. <laughs> I, I like to tell people that you have to start by thinking about how you want the world to be different. And then if you're passionate about the problems you're working on, um, you're gonna work really hard to make that difference and the rest will follow. So worrying too much about the tenure process or about checking boxes is, is ultimately counterproductive. The, the best work that you do, the work that's really going to make that difference from your career is going to be that work that's coming from your passion, from your heart. And the other just more practical advice that I would give people is that the University of Michigan is a really big place. And very often the resources, the, uh, the help that we have here for faculty trying to do their best work are, are not things that are going to be pushed to you. You're going to have to go out and find them, even to learn that they're there. So talking to colleagues, finding pointers about where those resources are that are the things you need to realize your goals, really important starting place for figuring this, uh, this great institution out. Yeah, that's a really great point, Alex. You know, I often talk to students that are thinking about the choice between going to a great large public like Michigan and going to a, a smaller Ivy League school, great, but much smaller in, in breadth. Uh, and I characterize the difference the same way you, know, you just did. Uh, here at Michigan, the resources are unbelievable. The breadth of expertise is amazing, but nobody holds your hand. You know, you've got to go out there and be willing to seek out colleagues and seek out opportunities. And once you do, they're myriad. You, you discover they're everywhere but you're not gonna have a colleague that holds you by the hand and takes you around necessarily and make sure that you do those things like you would at one of those smaller, very expensive Ivy League schools. You have to go and ask, but that's all right. Once you figure that out, it's amazing what's here. Yeah, and you know, one of the questions that's come up and we'll switch to audience questions uh, 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 now, um, has to do with the, you know, the tenure system. So, 
uh, one of you mentioned a bit earlier that it's great being a tenured professor because you can do these things and not worry quite so much uh, because you know we have a lifelong commitment to you and your scholarship and your teaching here. Um, but the other side is that you know folks are incredibly worried about either checking off the boxes or doing an adequate amount of scholarship to be above the bar for tenure in their department. So you know how should our colleagues you know be thinking about the role of tenure, either pre or post, uh, in thinking about their own engagement outside the academy? You know, um, my, my first faculty mentor at U of M when I first started as a faculty mentor was Mark Wilson. And whenever we sat down for my every couple of months review of my progress as a new faculty member, he said he'd start up, everyone would say, okay, first I wanna know how many lives you saved since we last met. <laughs> and then we'll talk about your papers. And I always always feel like, oh my God, I have to meet with Mark next week and I didn't save any more lives this week. <laughs> I gotta find some. Um, but I think, you know, we can do that. We can emphasize that like your work has meaning, you know, you you imbue your work with meaning, like like Alex was saying. You, you know, I think we can can continue to keep that really close connection with academics and impact. Um, as we are kind of bringing new faculty members into the field and having them go through this process. I wanted to say, I thought Alex's comments earlier, what Emily just said, were, were right on. You, you have to do what's in your heart. It, it goes back to, you know, the Polonius's line of to be true thy, to thyself. And you, you, when I first got here, I figured, oh, well, you know, this is, a, you know, I, I, what do I, you know, I'm, I'm a dumb guy from New Jersey. I can't believe I made it to the University of Michigan. It seemed like the top of the mountain. And I always said to myself, I'm just gonna work hard and I'm going to just do my thing and it'll be a good place to be from if I don't get promoted. Um, but with this, this university, is this, it is so deep that um, I wrote a, my first grant proposal and, and the guy who uh, was gonna help me with analysis, I literally wrote the book that uh, I was going, that I was using for the analysis in the, in the proposal. So yeah, I, I think you really, you have to go with your heart. And, and if it doesn't fit here, it'll fit somewhere else. Uh, but if you don't go with, with your heart and what you believe in, um, it, you're gonna be miserable anyway, so. Yeah, you know, I really sure that agree with that. Yeah, I'm sorry, Alex. Just to, to add, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the public always understands what a professor's job looks like, especially for <laughs> faculty members who are just getting started. So what's, what's on your plate? Um, teaching, designing courses, applying for research funding, um, service within your department, recruiting students. And then after, after all of that, um, then is when you have your time for your scholarship. And if you are lucky, for making an impact beyond the academy. So one, one thing that I would recommend to, to you, Mark, and to the universities, talk to the deans, talk to the department chairs about the load that we are putting onto our assistant professors. And there are many ideas floating around for new things that faculty members could be doing, new initiatives, great new goals that we have. But for every one of those that we layer on to people, what it's really subtracting from is that end of the day time when you're doing your best thought, when you're doing your impact um, outside uh, of, uh, of research. So we, we need to think a little bit more about how people's time is a finite resource and for every new thing that we put on them. Well, some, something important is probably what's being given up. Yep. So, you know, when we first started uh, this uh, work a number of years ago, trying to stimulate elevated levels of public engagement, a question I would get a lot, and I got the same question when I was Provost of Brown, is how much does it count for? You know, we talk about teaching and research and service, and depending upon the discipline, some folks like to turn it into a formula, you know, X percentage for your research and Y percentage for your teaching and Z percentage for something else. And how do you make it all count? Um, you know, the advice that I gave department chairs is that, you know, we're not that precise about things. There's subjective judgments involved overall. Uh, and I think that what you're looking for as you evaluate a colleague for tenure is, is this person elevate the level of importance and significance of your department? Are they 
A good and conscientious teacher, is their research impactful in their own peer group and are they making a difference in the world? Uh, but to put that into a formula um, is very difficult to do. I don't, I don't know how you see this play out in your department, but when you have discussions around tenure cases, for example, or promotions to full, you know, do people debate the role of engaged scholarship as compared to uh, publications and teaching evaluations? Well, in my college, uh, a lot of architecture is expressed through public engagement. That's how people show what they have contributed in the field of architecture. So that's a little more familiar in my college, and that helps the urban planners as well. So um, I, I ten, the tenure period got extended, uh, I think, a year or two in our college compared to some others to allow for that. That was good. Um, and a second point I'd make is that I think that teaching can often be more exciting to students, more um, transforming when it involves real problems that they are really contributing to, engaging with people who care about those problems who are not in the university. And so I think that actually one can produce some excellent teaching evaluations for tenure doing that potentially. Yeah, I want to underline what, again, you know, just highlight, especially what you said earlier too, Margaret, and it's the idea of uh, blending the, the, the tasks of teaching research and service as much as possible. So um, create your uh, teaching that kind of overlaps with some of your research that you are talking about your research to you know publicly that helps you like in a class that helps you think about it that brings the students brains into the work that you're doing um, teaching often brings uh, you know information into the field that I'm working in and and services really relate to all those things so the extent that you can dovetail tasks is I think a way to survive and uh, in, you know, in this kind of environment. So. so questions come in from several people uh, that converges on the point of how would you help or what kind of advice would you give to a faculty member, either junior or established, that wanted to take those first steps to be more publicly engaged if they were asking for your perspective or advice? And, you know, this question came from several people in several different forms. How do you get started? Well, I, think... I, would, I would say a few things. One is Ginsburg Center offers some great resources to help faculty see how to do this work. Um, but in addition, I would, I would um, talk with them about whether I could introduce them to some people and what kind of relationship they might build and how to build trust, how to listen. Um, I wouldn't be to, I would try not to make that sound too condescending, <laughs> um, but listening is really key. It is, is, I think it was Mark who said earlier, maybe Alex, that one learns a great deal from the people who are not at the university. And, but if you're the one figuring you're talking all the time, you're not listening. So um, listening, building trust, building a relationship, and that's especially important across uh, big differences in where we sit in society. Um, people with less education, people of, who are um, of a different race and have experienced a great deal of racial discrimination. It takes a lot of time and work to establish the relationships on which to build public engagement. Yeah, Alex, you were about to say something. <clears throat> My advice would be to start by thinking about who needs to know what about your work, um, because that's really going to be the bedrock of the, the strategy you're going to want to use to engage. Is it something the public needs to know about? Is it something that the state government does, Is it Congress? Um, it's going to be a different path depending on where you want to go, but what, what you don't want is to be trying to get publicity for its its own sake, right? Or our goal is not usually to be entertainment for people or to be self-promoting. There's some reason why people need to know. 
And uh, that, that should be the, the basis of your whole strategy. I want to also, I mean, I keep going back to what other people said because it was so brilliant. I'm going to say it again, and then maybe people think it was my idea and I look so brilliant. But Alex, you pointed out the university and reaching out to people. I mean, there's lots of people at this university with lots of community connections. So if you want to work in schools, reach out to somebody in, in education if you're not in education yourself. If, if you want to work in Detroit, there are a lot of people who are working in Detroit. There's the Detroit Center. So I think take advantage of this university and people are already there. And I think most of us, I would say one of the great things about this university is, you know, there's a lot of people here who want to just be helpful and are nice people, not competitive. And they'll invite you in, they'll say, I'll meet, I'll introduce you to this person. They might give you some tips on, you know, um, don't come in with your own idea, or if you do be open to what other people have to say and comment about it, don't be defensive. But using those networks that exist on campus, I think is a, a really great starting point for any new faculty member. You know, one of our attendees noted, I wonder what the world would look like if students and faculty at all levels were doing work that had impact. I think it's possible and it's our responsibility to make that possible. Uh, the idea of impact being infused throughout our curriculum and throughout all our work. Uh, any thoughts or responses? The conversation did touch a little bit on uh, teaching and how that may play a role. I think, well, in public health, I've been struck by um, how our students come in already making an impact sometimes, but then definitely want to, I mean, they come in with so much energy and um, time and, and, you know, um, just really kind of positive, big positive motion around this that um, really the students just need a little bit of guidance, you know, just kind of point them here and they really take on a problem. And, um, and that to me has been one of the most rewarding parts just in general of being a school of public health, but also in the last year. I mean, our team that's been doing this work have tons of students involved from small involvements to really, really huge career changing involvements. Yeah. And um, it's been really wonderful to see them be able to take that energy and put it somewhere and, and be able to see what that can do. Other thoughts about that interface with teaching? I don't think there's anything more empowering for students than getting to experience hands-on that they can make an impact. And providing that experience, that's, that's something that I, I have found whenever I've had the opportunity to let students get their hands dirty on, on real world problems. Um, it's been the most successful um, experience for, for them and for me. It's really something that, that changes people's entire career direction. So making sure that that happens for more students, that they get the opportunity to experience hands-on, that they can have an impact in the world before they, they leave U of M, that, that, that's something we should all be working towards. I, I was that. very lucky that um, in my second year as a faculty member, I got assigned to teach the final required capstone course in urban planning where the students work in partnership with city officials or community-based leaders of community-based organizations or neighborhood associations to advance the agendas of those partners to do a plan that can help those folks advance their agendas. And it enabled students to see poverty up close. It enabled them to deal directly with race issues. It, for many of them who had come from suburbs that were largely white, it really um, changed the way they looked at the world. One person actually, I remember her um, saying that she'd been a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras and she had never seen housing in such bad condition as she saw in one neighborhood of Detroit. And that is life-changing. And, and she now works in neighborhoods like that in Philadelphia doing housing development. Yeah, I think about this also, like, you know, like in the medical school, the medical students in the second year start seeing patients and anybody here who's gone to Michigan Medicine, you know that uh, you're often, you even sign off and you, you know that you're gonna have students 
uh, we're a teaching hospital, you will have students coming in and sometimes you have to tell your story two or three times. And I think if we all had that same idea that when we go and do our research, we bring students along. And I think our community partners um, really appreciate that. They don't, I don't, they don't see that as, a, as an issue or anything. So um, I think we need to engage them in our work and our everyday work that we do um, in our community engaged work. Very good. Well, look, you know, thank you all very much uh, for the uh, engaging conversation and for all your work. And, you know, beyond the good you do in the world, you represent the university spectacularly well in the eyes of the public. So as, as the current person privileged to sit in the president's chair, uh, I thank you on behalf of the university for that, for the uh, substantive contributions you work, uh, uh, you do through your work, but also for representing us uh, so well. Uh, I'm going to hand things over now to our new Vice President for Government Relations, uh, Chris Kolb. And Chris is joining us, I believe, by video. Thank you, President Sliso, for the introduction. And thank you to the 2019 and 2020 awardees for your engaged scholarship the inspiration you instill in all of us to be active citizens and for the personal commitment and professional excellence you have given in support of our communities and our nation. It is important to remember and highlight that this engagement and leadership begins right here with the drive of our faculty and the public mission of our university. There are stars across our campus who are impacting society through their scholarship and pushing the limits of the work above and beyond the academy and the roles as scholars to benefit those around them. And as any of our astronomers will tell us, there are more stars just waiting to be discovered. That's what excites me most about President Slissel's initiative, the promise of what we can achieve. I've seen this firsthand when your work gets into the hands of policymakers, it creates better policy. When your work reaches the public, they elect better leaders. When your work informs the experts in state and local government, it translates to stronger schools, safer neighborhoods, healthier communities, and budgets that solve the problems of our society. The next part of today's program will feature four speakers that will share their research and how they are translating that research into public impact. They will shed light into how they do it, keys to their success and insight as to how others can do it as well. So thank you to our next round of speakers and I will turn it over to Christina Cole who heads up our DC office as Executive Director of Federal Relations and is an Assistant Vice President for Research Federal Relations to moderate the next part of our program. Thank you, Vice President Cole. Before I begin the next part of our program, I wanted to note that at the end of today's lightning round, our distinguished award recipients have generously offered to stay and engage in breakout room discussions. So please stick around at the end of these talks ask questions, network, and thank our participants for sharing their insights with us today. The next session features a series of lightning talks that highlight ways in which U of M scholars are actively engaging communities, improving society, and influencing policy. Their experiences provide texture to the many different meaningful ways faculty expertise can create social, societal change. Our first speaker, Professor J.J. Prescott, is a professor of law and of economics. Professor Prescott was named Distinguished University Innovator last August for launching the U of M online court project. I welcome him here today to share how this project came to be a game-changing solution for courts across the country. Professor Prescott. Great, thank you very much. Can you all see my slides? Great, so um, I'm an, a lawyer and an economist by training and uh, I became interested in a career involving research and teaching very early on. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have guessed that I would be giving a lightning talk on public engagement to be honest and 
and, and highlighting how what we do outside of the university can really transform what we do inside the university and vice versa. I'm here today because I played an important role in envisioning, designing, and implementing a piece of legal technology called Matterhorn in courts throughout the country. At its core, let me see, at its core, Matterhorn is an online platform that allows different parties to communicate in a structured way to resolve or adjudicate an ongoing legal issue. And it endeavors to do this in a way that is fair, transparent, and satisfying. Indeed, Matterhorn has become a model for online dispute resolution, or ODR, in the US. How did all of this start? Well, with one of my students, Ben Gubernick. Ben came to me wanting to do something different. He was a law student, but he didn't really want to be a lawyer, at least at that point. My public engagement through Matterhorn was, at least in part, the result of wanting to invest in a student who wanted to change the world. He helped me stretch out of my comfort zone, and the consequences have been so important for me and my career, and I hope uh, for others as well. So we started talking about what we might wanna do. We weren't even sure where to start. Were we talking about a service, a business? How were we going to change the world? Um, eventually we stumbled on the possibility of using technology to improve how courts work. In particular, we wanted to address the fact that there were millions of outstanding warrants for minor infractions, like not paying a traffic fine. These warrants were really easy to resolve if you can get into the same room with the judge, but getting to court turns out to be not very easy at all. In many ways, courts are an anomaly in our world. We still offer basic legal services. We animate our legal rights in brick and mortar buildings. This method of delivery is really inefficient and also creates huge disparities. Uh, to do almost anything in court, even deal with a minor ticket, people have to take a day off work and travel to a courthouse. Um, there are so many barriers to achieving justice in our courts. Uh, they can be economic, they can be physical, they can be psychological. Imagine taking a day off work from an hourly paid job to contest a ticket, costing you perhaps as much as the ticket itself. You then take a bus to a courthouse or borrow a car, wait many hours to see a judge, and then you are expected to explain that you're flat broke in a courtroom filled with people you don't know. For anything more serious, using the swords and shields of the laws is mostly out of reach. Uh, and what about those who, because of the same barriers, can't make it at all? How can this be the best way? This was the crux of the problem I wanted to address. From the get-go, the answer was straightforward for me, online platform technology. We had, we had accomplished a lot in this space and it was something uh, that we could use to solve this problem. If people can go to court or for that matter, any government agency online, perhaps, perhaps asynchronously, and do so with the right support to ensure a high quality, authentic experience, how much more accessible would justice be in our country? The courts are really just a bundle of services. Some of those services, like criminal trials, uh, most likely need to occur in person, but many others do not. And if it were possible to design an online environment that people could trust and understand and that would empower judges, freeing them to focus on more complex in-person cases, we could nudge the courts towards a different, uh, toward a different paradigm. How did my engagement with uh, the public begin? Well, Ben and I started talking with district courts in Michigan and the state court administrative office. We came, to the, we came to them as problem solvers, trying to improve what they do while of course being humble and trying to focus on making their lives easier. Uh, the university was from the very beginning extremely supportive in all of this. Our pilot implementations, which focused on resolving traffic tickets and outstanding minor warrants as proof of concept were a real success. And the rest is history. Today, Matterhorn, the platform has handled more than 170,000 cases in the US. Um, it has contracts in more than 22 or about 22 states right now. Um, while we started to resolve minor infractions and outstanding warrants, it quickly became clear to us uh, and to the courts we were working with uh, that there, were, there was a lot more potential to this basic idea of opening up courts using technology. Matterhorn now offers solutions uh, for family court matters, foreclosure cases, small claims, mediation, criminal misdemeanors, and others. Um, from the beginning, Matterhorn's uh, outcomes have been really great across the board. In a nutshell, people in courts find Matterhorn to be easy to access and use, fair and efficient. My own research shows that Matterhorn dramatically improves access, uh, reducing default in small claims, reducing time to case closure, uh, increasing the likelihood of warrants being resolved. It also reduces racial disparities in the law and makes our courts safer. Because of time, I'm just gonna click through a few of these results slides. I'm happy to share them in some other uh, in some other way, but um, five minutes is, isn't all that much. Um, the last year has been a hard one, and not surprisingly, interest in Matterhorn by courts across the country have, has never been stronger, given the need to be remote a lot of the time. Courts are absolutely changing in dramatic ways. 
And I like to believe that Matterhorn has made that process at least a little bit easier than it otherwise would have been. Today, I feel like I've come full circle. Uh, I, I spend a lot of my time these days working with Matterhorn and courts to conduct research, uh, to better understand courts and how they work to start the cycle all over again. For me, one very important lesson has been that going outside of the university to work with people outside of the academy opens up research opportunities I would have never had otherwise. It's also engaged my students in ways I couldn't have expected. Um, and um, really, I've concluded that public engagement is, is a, a virtuous circle for researchers. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Prescott. Next, we have Professor Tammy Chang, Assistant Professor of Family Medicine. Professor Chang has been an impactful advocate for our youth, giving them agency in the policy making process. Professor Chang. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction and congratulations again to this year and last year's award winners. You know, it's a real pleasure to be here today on behalf of my team to talk about our work engaging youth across the country via My Voice. You know, My Voice is a national text message poll of, of over 1,000 youth age 14 to 24. And our goal is to elevate youth voice to inform policies and practices in real time to improve the health and well being of young people. And the way we do that is by engaging young people that typically would not or could not participate in research. And this would only be possible with my with from support from the University of Michigan MQ program um, through Mishar and through the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. Of course, of course my home department uh, of family medicine who believes in the mission of engaging marginalized populations in research. So why do we do my voice? How do we start? Early in my career as a health services researcher, um, challenge working with policymakers, and it often sound a little bit like this. So as a health services researcher, my job is to wait for people and um, to, to come to me or for me to go to other people to answer questions that might inform policy. So policymakers would call me and they would invariably ask me a wonderful, very, very important question. And I would say to them, wow, wow, that's a wonderful, important question. Um, give me a year. I'll write a grant on that, then I'll put in an IRB, and I'll have an answer to you, maybe in a year, a year and a half. And that's what they would say to me, well, Dr. Chang, uh, we're going to be voting on this next week. And so this became a really big problem. We saw this huge mismatch between the timeline of policymaking and a timeline of research. And we knew that we could and had to do better. So together with a multidisciplinary group of non-tenured fantastic collaborators from across campus, we created My Voice, this national poll of youth. And so what we do is ask three to five open-ended questions weekly on a wide range of topics. There's nothing fancy about what we do. Um, these topics could be anything from opioid use to barriers to voting, to how COVID has impacted lives um, and behaviors of youth. And so a lot of people will say, well, Dr. Chang, why do you work with, you know, as a doctor, as a family doctor, um, you know, they're healthy. And this is because we really believe that youth are one of the greatest resources society has. We believe in this idea of the triple dividend. When we do research, we want to have an incredibly high return on investment. And when you do research that improves the policies and practices that impact youth, you help them now, you impact their future health, and also the health of future generations. So for us, it was a no brainer. And one of the things that we really focused on was engaging youth from all walks of life, because we believe that youth are experts of their own opinions, of their own experiences. And we wanted to get the stories and experiences um, because that is what is needed to create policies is what's happening in the real lives, the lived experiences of young people. So the reason we focus on these open-ended text message survey questions is to get at the how and the why of the issues that affect young people. That's what policies need, policymakers need to make good policy. So no stories without data, no st data without stories, that is our motto. And as researchers in my training, we were trained to collect lots and lots of data, but often we're not good at getting at the stories or the narratives, the stuff that really moves people and the policies into action. 
Because what we're trying to do is transform the way that research impacts policy by giving the right people the right information at the right time. And it's never been more critical than in our, our pandemic now. And so we take the opinions and thoughts of young people through these text messages, and we create outputs that match what policymakers might need when they need it. So that could be an infographic, a white paper, a policy brief, a personal communication. And of course, um, we publish in top tier peer reviewed uh, journals. And we're very proud to partner with many local and national governments and organizations, including the Washington House County Health Department, MDHHS, CDC, the National Academies, community organizations, and numerous universities across the country, just to name a few. You know, some of these specific partnerships have led to uh, campaigns like this one in the Washington County um, Health Department, focusing on mental health among youth. We've also um, helped policymakers to draft legislation that impact the health of young people. We've been part of two consensus reports, the National Academies. And most importantly, we bring the young people that we work with to the table to discuss um, important topics. And here you'll see Sochi Amaro, who's a second year undergrad here at U of M, talking on a panel with national experts about testing strategies and protective behaviors on campus. And of course, um, our work doesn't stop when we publish a paper, it starts. It starts because what we wanna do is make sure the conversations we have at the proverbial conference room table happens at the kitchen table. So we are talking and working with our communication professionals to make sure not only the young people who are sharing their thoughts and opinions know what's happening, but that everyday people understand the real lived experience of young people today. You know, we believe that my voice represents the very best that the University of Michigan has to offer. It takes the amazing talent at every level from high school students, undergrads, med students, grad students, postdocs, fellows, and faculty from across the campus and across different schools. And by engaging marginalized populations and communities, we're elevating their voice in a way that matches the educational goal of students, the aspirational goals of teachers, while meeting the needs of society today. Thank you so much on behalf of our entire team and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. Um, there are often times when published scholarship captures the interest of our policymakers. Understanding the whys of these interests or concerns and translating scholarly recommendations to address these concerns in an effort to strengthen policies often takes time, perseverance, and patience. Professor Jeremy Kress, Assistant Professor of Business Law and of Business Administration, will share how his work got the attention of Congress and how he has leveraged that interest to inform legislation. Professor Kress. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Jeremy Kress. I'm an Assistant Professor of Business Law at the Ross School of Business. Before entering academia, I was an attorney at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, DC. And my scholarship now focuses on many of the same financial regulatory issues that I worked on at the Fed. One of my favorite parts of being an academic is the ability to engage with policymakers about research topics that I'm researching. So today I'd like to highlight two areas in which I've had an impact non-bank financial regulation and bank merger oversight. About four years ago, I began researching how the United States regulates non-bank financial institutions like insurance companies and hedge funds. Shortly thereafter, the Treasury Department proposed changes to non-bank financial regulation, which in my view would have inappropriately weakened safeguards that were put in place after the 2008 financial crisis. The US Senate Banking Committee scheduled a hearing uh, to evaluate the Treasury Department's proposed reforms and because of my research invited me to come testify. Although neither the Treasury Department nor the Senate adopted the advice that I offered at the hearing, I do hope that my recommendations form a blueprint for what the new administration might do to reinvigorate non-bank financial regulation in the future. A second stream of my research focuses on bank mergers. During my time at the Fed, I became concerned that the regulatory agencies rubber stamp bank mergers uh, in a way that's harmful to local communities and the broader financial system. 
So when I entered academia, I wrote an article called Modernizing Bank Merger Review, suggesting strategies to strengthen the merger review process. After posting a draft of that article online, several congressional staffers contacted me and asked if I would be interested in turning my recommendations into legislation. So over in the, the ensuing months, I worked with those staffers to craft a bill and ultimately Senator Elizabeth Warren and several members of the US House, including Michigan Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, introduced the Bank Merger Review Modernization Act based substantially on the recommendations that I made in my article. As I reflect on my past public engagement work and as I plan future public engagement, I think there are three insights that have helped me influence policy. First, I view my public engagement work and my research as mutually reinforcing. By engaging with policymakers, I not only am able to apply my past research to current policy debates, but I'm also able to generate ideas for new research. It is that virtuous cycle uh, that JJ referenced earlier. Second, Social media can be a really valuable tool to influence policy. I had never been on social media before becoming an academic, but I've found that tweeting about financial regulation is a really valuable way to connect with policymakers, especially congressional staffers. And third, small investments of time can have a big payoff in building relationships. When possible, I always try to make myself available for time-sensitive engagement opportunities like suggesting questions for congressional hearings or speaking with reporters. Finally, I, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, some of my mentors and role models here at Michigan who have uh, set me up for success with public engagement. Ford School Dean Michael Barr not only gave me my first break into academia, uh, but I'm also inspired by his example of how scholars can influence financial regulation policy. In addition, uh, my colleagues and administrators here at the Ross School, many of whom themselves participate in public engagement work, uh, have been incredibly supportive of my public engagement activities. I'm extremely grateful to them uh, for their encouragement. So let me just close by saying thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. It really is a privilege to be part of a university that so values public engagement work. Thank you, Professor Kress. This year, we decided to end this series of talks with a shift in perspective. We move from scholars whose careers are influential to one who aspires to be a future academic and change maker. Catherine Garten graduated in 2020 with a bachelor's degrees in both environment and psychology. Ms. Garten. Thanks, Christina. Um, I'm really happy to be here and, and be part of this event. Um, I think my presence may be a bit unexpected. I am not a faculty member, although someday I do hope to be one. Um, as Christina said, I graduated from U of M just a few months ago, um, and I'm hoping to pursue a PhD in social psychology. Since I'm uh, representing more of a student perspective here, and I still have a long way to go before reaching your stage of my career, I wanted to speak more about teaching and mentorship as forms of impact in and of themselves. I know mentorship has been incredibly impactful for me, and as faculty, teaching and mentorship are forms of impact that are always at your fingertips. Um, so I'd like to back up for just a moment to kind of tell my story. Um, growing up, there was one issue that always tugged at me, which was the environment. Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist and study coral reefs for many years, but I learned in high school that most of the coral reefs in the world would die within my lifetime. And that seemed like very poor job security. <laughs> so I thought maybe I should focus on the issue that was causing that harm, which was climate change. And for most of high school and college, I pursued a career in climate policy. And I did a lot of advocacy work. Along the way, I found myself becoming fascinated by the political dynamics I was witnessing and the relationships I was trying to build with people on both sides of the aisle. I spent a semester interning for Senator Peters in Washington, DC. And I was struck by watching 
principles from social psychology unfold in front of my eyes on the Senate floor and in the news the next day. Things like confirmation bias, prejudice and stereotyping, conformity, moral foundations, things that were preventing people from finding common ground. And I was troubled by the fact that everyone, including myself, seemed to be living within our own neat narratives and discounting the ideas of those we disagreed with. This seemed to underlie every other issue I cared about, all the ones that don't get addressed efficiently because no one can agree on the steps to take. So I found myself really struggling to navigate my own career path during this time because I was torn between the unnecessary dichotomy of impact versus academia. I couldn't shake my interest in psychological questions, but I also wanted my work to be accessible and useful. Now, impact and inquiry aren't mutually exclusive and the honorees here today are the types of models and mentors I needed to know that was possible. I actually called a, a close friend and mentor in the midst of one of my routine existential crises at the time. And he passed down something that one of his mentors had asked him. It was not what I was expecting, but he asked, what do you think about when you're falling asleep? What are the questions that you're pondering when you have nothing else to do? Those are the things that are nagging at your soul. And I really don't think that I would have switched my major and my sort of career trajectory to psychology three semesters before graduating without having the support of mentors in my life. And I think it's important to say here that the mentors who have influenced me the most are those who were more invested in me than in my path and who wanted me to do what I was most passionate about. Because ultimately, as this mentor counseled me, um, if you pursue what you're intrinsically driven by, you will have a bigger impact because your heart and your soul will be in it. So some mentors serve that kind of big picture role, um, but even once you've settled on a path of some kind, you need mentors to help you navigate it. I love learning independently, but there's no handbook, at least that I've found, for how to be a successful and impactful psychologist who cares about social issues. There's so much that I don't know that I don't know at this point, and mentors and teachers are like flashlights in the dark, pointing out opportunities that I didn't even know existed. I think you can probably take the brightest student and they'll still flounder without that flashlight and without that nudge or maybe gentle shove to get your hands dirty on something outside of the classroom. And on that note, I wanna say that although everyone needs good mentors, it probably makes the biggest impact for people who had the fewest opportunities, resources and connections to begin with. Um, and I just think that's important to remember from an equity angle. So zooming out a bit, I know that time is finite and there's so many things competing for our attention. I certainly have never had to juggle getting my R01 grant with advising national policy, but I can only imagine that it's really hard to go the extra mile and seek broader impact with your work. And teaching and mentorship take time too, but I think that they're just as valuable. And whatever drives you to be in academia and whatever stage you're at in your career, one thing that will always be impactful is investing in the people who are coming after you. Um, everyone enters their field because someone or something piqued their curiosity and helped them learn the skills that they needed. And your students are the people who will be carrying on your tradition and building on the work and the impact you've started. So I guess to wrap up, I just wanted to say, sort of speaking as someone who's just starting out on their path, that I really, really admire people who seek impact with their work um, and that you can always make an impact close to home. Teaching, mentoring, empowering students who want to engage creates a cascade of impact into the future and it magnifies the work that you all have pioneered. Um, and people like me will be very grateful for it as well. So um, thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome to hear everyone's perspectives today. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Catherine, and to the other uh, lightning speakers. Really interesting, engaging talks. Uh, I'm going to uh, thank the audience in general before turning things back to uh, uh, Christina uh, to introduce uh, breakout discussions. So congratulations again to all the award winners. Uh, thanks to all the participants today. Uh, I certainly learned a lot and continue to be inspired by the outstanding work of our faculty. So keep it up, everybody. Uh, wish us good luck and good karma tonight in the NCAA basketball tournament at seven o'clock. And uh, go blue. And back to you, Christina. Thank you, President Schlissel.
Attendees are now welcome to join our awardees and lightning round speakers and breakout rooms for opportunity to ask additional questions and network with others. There's an option at the bottom of your screen labeled breakout. Click on that. You can choose any room you'd like to join. You're also free to move between, between rooms as you wish. Thank you again for coming today and I hope to see you in one of our virtual meeting spaces.